Clog TV. Beyond the Policy. Yeah, welcome back to the Coco Digest Morning Show. If you're just tuning in, this is the Coco Digest Morning Show, and we're about to have our main discussion. Now, don't forget, you can join in the conversation on our Facebook and YouTube stream here in the studios. You can just send in your comments, look for Clog TV on these social media platforms and join in the conversation. You can also send your comments to our WhatsApp number displayed on your screen. Now, Along the line, the phone lines will be open, so you can also call and ask your questions. Now, today's conversation is about anxiety, so the causes, symptoms, and treatments. And of course, our guest for today is someone we've had here before. We had an amazing conversation, and he's in the person of Dr. Abishai and Lima. And I'm going to read his profile. It's pretty lengthy, so this should tell you that this man knows what he's about. So... Abishai Anlima is a licensed consultant, clinical neuropsychologist on very high demand who defies categorization. He pursued clinical psychology from the University of Ghana and currently practices as a clinical psychologist, researcher, and lecturer. Now, these to him are neither about professions nor career building, but about the love and passion to impart practical wisdom on African-centered scientific values and life support to people. It is therefore cogent, is his cogent creed to offer his valuable services to all. Now, <clears throat> let's continue. He also, um, yes, okay. Now, Especially vulnerable people in the society, such as children, teenagers, women, elderly persons, and people with disability, he also wants to be able to reach these people and, of course, impart his wisdom into them and help them, support them as well. Now, following his passion for mental health, Abishai supported and became the head of Friends of Mental Health, which is an NGO that focuses on seeking funds to support mental health in Ghana. Furthermore, he has had numerous clinical experiences working in the Kolibu Teaching Hospital throughout his career in the health sector, and he has had rich experiences working in departments or units such as stroke, burns and reconstructive surgery, fevers, nephrology, sickle cell, hematology, and psychiatry. Currently, he is also serving as a consultant and lecturer for the Delight Wellness Consult and Delight Counseling School, where his erudite interventions have helped in cases such as stress, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, dissociative disorders, personality disorders, adjustment disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, sleep wake disorders, substance related and addictive disorders, and many more. His interest, his interest in positive psychology has moved him to make phenomenal impact on non-clinical cases such as learning and memory enhancement, attention training, time management, self-esteem, and many others. With a desire to promote African interest and virtues, Abishai has been a passionate reader of peer-reviewed journals that bother on Pan-Africanism, health and well-being, and traditional treatment. This has earned him a role as an editor for the National Institute of Health, Health and Care Research in the UK and resource person for the Health Project. Many students in the University of Ghana and the University of Professional Studies at the undergraduate and graduate levels have benefited phenomenally from his tutelage as he works in the most practical, ethical, and scientific oriented African modus. His commitment will always be to provide psychological health intervention, research, and impact knowledge until his good is better and his better is best. Hmm. So you can see that today's conversation, very in-depth. Thank you so much for joining us. And it was, your, your profile is an amazing read. Like, I just want to give you the platform to teach us. <laughs> Let's go. 
<laughs> so how are you doing? It's been a while since we saw you. Yeah, it's about two months now. Yes. Yes, I'm doing very great. Oh, we are glad to hear. And thank you so much for joining us here again. So the last time you were here, we were talking about substance abuse, you know, in relation to mental health. So if you can oh. give us a little recap, then we continue. Okay. So the last time we met, we spoke about the fact that Mental health has been a very serious issue mm -hmm. globally in our country as well. And some of the highlights uh, was the fact that currently about one in seven persons are living with a mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. And as for Ghana, 41% mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, of the population are dealing with some forms of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. But 10% of the Ghanaian population, ours is very serious. Okay. They will not it down to substance abuse. And we came to appreciate the fact that people who abuse substances like alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, mm -hmm. amphetamines, and the others are not bad people. It's just that abuse satisfies a need. Mm -hmm. And addiction satisfies a need. Yeah. So if you don't get them the right help, they'll continue to abuse medications or drugs until they end their lives. Yeah. And we spoke about how we can be able to help them. Uh, both professionally at a family level mm. and individual level as yeah, well. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yes, and it means of building resilience and capacity for me. Yeah. So today is about anxiety. So in the scientific and psychological aspects, what can we term as anxiety? Okay, so anxiety is something that is normal. Mm. <clears throat> it's a normal part of everyday life. We go through anxiety. But anxiety disorder becomes a health problem that demands attention. So we can become anxious at a point whereby there is some levels of worry, uh, trepidation uh, about an issue or two. Mm -hmm. Anxiety itself means you are worried about something that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. It's either it will happen or it won't happen. Mm -hmm. But it becomes a disorder when this is affecting your academic performance, your social functioning, how you relate with others, and your work performance as well. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, anxiety has so many different causes, but are there any scientific causes that maybe if I come to your clinic or your hospital, you know that, okay, this one... Because like you said, we are worrying about something that has not yet happened. Okay. It may or may not happen. So can we, do we have like, or do you in the field where you operate have specific causes of anxiety? Okay, so through research and experience, we've come to realize that we could have a trauma mm -hmm. uh, being a very significant cause of anxiety. We have environmental factors, we have genetic factors, and individual factors as well. We are comparing them one after the other. Yeah. So trauma, a person goes through a traumatic experience. It could be they witnessing an accident or being part of it, mm -hmm. a fire explosion, an earthquake, something of that sort, or some injustice at the workplace or in the family level, mm -hmm. they are kicked out of their job. And that could become a basis for anxiety disorder. We have genetic factors whereby anxiety could run through families. So maybe your mother, your father, an uncle, someone within the family had it and then it becomes passed uh, on to you. So, so anxiety can be passed on genetically. Very well. Goodness. Yes. So you see a number of children. I think currently worldwide, uh, WHO did a research in 2019. Mm -hmm. And they found out that worldwide 301 million people are living with anxiety disorders. And out of that, about 58 million are children, hmm. adolescents, very severe ones. So 2024, I'm sure the figure would go up because yeah. the COVID-19 has made mental health very serious yeah. and worse in most cases. I mean, COVID, with my personal experience with COVID, I realized that work, school, were, as much as they are all parts of life, they were some form of distractions you know, against certain personal things that we, were, we, we all deal with. And having to sit at home and literally not do anything, not go anywhere. Those who would work from home would work. But you are now home. You're not moving about anymore, nice. distracted with maybe some chit-chat with a colleague or chit-chat with a friend. It's either your phone or your work. You're at home with a thing. So 
the issues bothering you come and sit with you. <laughs> yes, yes. So I think COVID, that was one of the bright sides of COVID yeah. that mental health awareness became more popular Apply. because yeah. even parents were now understanding what teachers go through with their kids because <laughs> they school. just dump them off in school and come and pick them later in the evening a few hours later they are asleep the next morning rains repeat so it's good you mentioned that so with the genetic one i want to understand okay is it that the anxiety becomes a gene like maybe dimples or something <laughs> dominant <laughs> recessive genes how how does that work? Well, in fact, uh, this is an area of current or ongoing re uh, research okay. ways. So we are seeing things like um, anxiety, uh, some forms of uh, mental disorders, mm. even substance abuse being passed on genetically. Yeah. So it looks as if over time the genes are adopting it. Okay. And as we pass over our genes to the uh, subsequent uh, generation, some of them come to pick up. Oh. Yes. Okay. I, th I think I have seen some, um, you know, this social media psychologist talking about even trauma can be passed down. And yes. there's even the spiritual aspect where maybe sometimes your parents made certain choices that took their lives in a certain path. And if you are not careful, you may tell the same line. Well. So it's something about generational cycles or something like that. Yes. So are they all related? Uh, uh, yes, please. So that's how it often happens. Mm. It looks as if everything we are doing, we are setting a genetic predisposition for okay. it for our future children. Okay. That's why we are very careful with how we handle ourselves. Mm. Because we might think it affects only us, but in the end, we pass it over. Yeah. That's how come we have individual factors also affecting uh, anxiety. Okay. For example, some people have what you call a type A personality. Mm -hmm. They are always overly ambitious with this competitive spirit, I must always be the mm. first. And that alone can create a cycle of anxiety mm. in a person. Even parenting can be a cause yeah. uh, of anxiety as well. The way our parents raise mm. us, sometimes it becomes a factor. Doc, this one, they touch on it. <laughs> yes. You know, when you are second in class, the person who was first, does he have two heads? Mm -hmm. And now you are forced to also try to go and be first and things like that, putting pressure on you mm. at a very young age. Very well. Yeah. I think it's something that has become uh, widespread for generations. Mm. It is normal for parents to want the best uh, in life and positions for their children. But unhealthy competition becomes a cause of severe anxiety. Mm -hmm. So there could be a class of about, let's say, 30 students. Yeah. And the parent is saying, you must always be the first. So the child comes fit position, they can't appreciate mm -hmm. it. But the best way is to encourage them to be the best version of themselves. So if your child is doing the best he, can, uh, he or she could, and he's going to end up being the 30th in class, that's fine. Yeah, but you know, as a parent too, you don't want to also waste money, you know, putting you've gone to put your child in Montessori because now the complaints about our public school system is really bad. So yeah. your child is in some international school, you want to get your money's worth. So I think that is one of the reasons maybe parents put pressure on their kids to do better. I better. mean, at the end too, they tell us it's our future and truly it is because it's your credentials and your performance that may also facilitate how your life, the trajectory of your life also goes. But then let's come to the environmental factors. Factors. What are some of the things that will cause anxiety in our environment? Environment, that's good. You see, we all live in uh, neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And in our neighborhoods, we have the social environment, we have the physical environment or the natural environment. Mm -hmm. This could pose factors for anxiety. Okay, let's talk, uh, touch on the physical environment. Okay. I think currently a green trend in Ghana is about uh, galamse destroying our water bodies. Mm -hmm. And now we are having children born, and uh, the nose is disfigured, yeah. the eyes is somewhere, with all forms of congenital defects. All because they are exposed to toxins and lead and mercury that drains into our water bodies, mm. and we are consuming them. And some of these environmental issues could be a cause of anxiety in most people, and about how the next generation will be able to fare. Mm. People live in neighborhoods where they are... Um, uh, bars and restaurants and um, groups making all kinds of noise, playing mm. loud music throughout the night. And this loud music is intolerable to them. Okay. That could also be a cause of anxiety. So 
in a situation where maybe the neighborhood is no longer safe, like the incidence of what we term as quashe boys, is that something that can cause anxiety? Uh, very well. Uh, all those uh, factors uh, impact. People live in neighborhoods whereby it's not safe. Mm. Uh, you are going out and you are easily robbed uh, mm. at gunpoint or someone draws a knife to you, you lose your phone. Yeah. And that alone has become a cause of anxiety in a number of people. Okay. Yes. So, <clears throat> I know you as psychologists and scientists, you're always doing research. So, what is the latest news on anxiety disorders? Because, I mean, now everybody is claiming they have anxiety. Anxiety. So, what are the latest findings? I think people are uh, diagnosing themselves. Yes. They well. go on social media <laughs> and then they begin to say, oh, this way I have some, or I go to head this, or I'm sure I'm having. Okay, so with the current uh, trend when it comes to research on anxiety disorders, we've now come to realize that anxiety disorder has become the number one mental health disorder. In fact, it is the most predominant or most widespread mental mm -hmm. disorder, even much more widespread than depression. Okay. So depression takes a second position after anxiety disorders. And the question is, why is that becoming the case? Well, some people too can say that, so I, I think I've heard a, a number of people who say they don't listen to news, news. Because news is always giving us bad things happening. There's some bombing here, yeah. there's an assassination here and there, and then it causes them to get agitated. Agitated. Yes. If we find a number of cases where by in the hospital, people come and it's like, they are always glued to either Al Jazeera, CNN, mm -hmm. or some of our local news and reading the newspapers and... Uh, they say no news is uh, good news. Mm. So oftentimes the news is all, all about bad things happen and an accident happening over here. Yeah. And with the social media, you see a video come up and mm -hmm. people's heads are chopped off, people yeah. are bent beyond. And this becomes a basis for anxiety in some people. So if you know you can't handle it, as you always say, viewer discretion is advised. advised yeah. yes. But then also, people will also say we are seeing who and... So somebody who is not even watching all these things still has anxiety because, anxiety. you know, so dark the con of man. Even though he hasn't seen any evidence that anybody will do something to him, mm. he may, he's still afraid that he may go out and then something bad would happen, like okay. his phone gets stolen or right. being stabbed. Mm. So in a situation like that too, how, how would we term it? I term it good. So in fact, people can develop anxiety problems vicariously. Mm. Vicariously means that it's like something happens to somebody. Either you hear about it, you witness it, and that becomes a base of personal anxiety in you that, mm -hmm. what if this happened to me? Mm -hmm. That's why uh, thought process play a very key role okay. when it comes to anxiety. Uh, we often use a simple experiment. We call it the ice clay experiement. Okay. You know, when you put ice in the sun, it melts. It melts. Yes, but clay, <laughs> yes, clay will always add in. Yeah. So the fact that it's sun doesn't mean that uh, clay should melt or it depends on the content. So, you know, we, we are made of clay. So <laughs> Please me, I'm so... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so these factors play a very key role when it comes mm -hmm. to anxiety. So some people haven't been through it, but vicariously they ask themselves, what if this happens, happened to me? Yeah. Or there is a, a near miss is a mm -hmm. situation, like the accident that happened in East Legon. Mm -hmm. Someone could say, oh, I just passed there about 10 minutes and then this accident happened. What I'm if it was me? Again. And then they begin to become so yeah. anxious about it as if uh, they were in that mm -hmm. particular situation. So we do get all this, but tough factors play a key role okay. in bringing about that. So what are some of the symptoms? I mean, earlier we were talking yes. about how sometimes a trigger, a, maybe an issue with somebody and then your heart starts yes. palpitating. Yes, it's true. Things like that. So what are some of the symptoms of, of anxiety? Anxiety. To make it easier for the audience, I will categorize it in three main dimensions. Okay. So we can look at the symptoms in terms of the cognitive aspects. Okay. We could look at the emotional aspect too and the behavioral or physical aspects. So cognitively, some of the symptoms we realize in the hospitals when we are doing this assessment and diagnosis that they have this persistent or obsessive thoughts about a particular worrying situation mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem to live. Yeah. Even when they are asleep, it comes in their dreams. Mm -hmm. Some do have terrible nightmares about some of the anxiety provoking or producing a situations that they keep on thinking about. Some lose concentration, some not able to pay attention cognitively, um, some become so obsessed 
they are unable to think positively, everything becomes negatively interpreted. Mm -hmm. That becomes a cognitive aspect. Some even realize that they are having memory issues, easily forgetting and bumping into people. Mm -hmm. Then with the emotional aspect, if a person often becomes easily startled, mm -hmm. the heart palpitations come in, mm -hmm. and some to become easily irritated. So someone does something small and then they are just firing at them. Mm -hmm. They could be your parents, they could be your manager, yes. they could be your I teacher. We should touch on our parents because <laughs> our parents seem to think we have become softer, or our generation is softer, but I am very sure they also experience things like anxiety and these mental health issues. So let's touch on that. What were some of the things they we can term from their behaviors or displays of behavioral actions that we can term as, no, this could have been a result of anxiety? Anxiety. So um, my mother often says that if you see a mother beat the child so mercilessly, mm. it could be that they are experiencing trauma from their husband, mm. so they vent it on, yes. uh, on the children. It's like there has been some generational um, uh, differences. The way our parents were raised, mm. things that will happen during their time is different from our generation. Mm. To be honest, our parents endured a number of things that in our generation, some children are not able to endure those things. Mm. Those times they will go to school barefooted, uh, yeah. even, even, even TV, to even have black and white TV was a, <laughs> was a privilege and all that. But the fact is, things have changed in our generation. Yeah. So the way parents are going to handle their children would either give them resilience or it will make them prone to mental health issues like anxiety mm -hmm. we are discussing. And that's something parents have to be cautious of. Okay. So we build a home environment whereby we can be able to uplift the children rather than destroy them. Yes, but we're also in a situation where if you go to your, your parents right now that I'm depressed, they say, ah, you have a roof over your head, you have food to eat, you have clothes on your back. What again? Again. You know, why are you depressed? Life is good for you. Sure. So it seems as though they don't fully understand what it is to be depressed, depressed or anxious. Sure. As compared to us this in this generation, how, how do we bridge that gap? Let's say maybe my parents or your own parents, how would you advise our viewers to be able to bridge that gap? gap okay. In fact, uh, parenting has become a, a serious factor, causing mm -hmm. anxiety in children, and without help, they grow into adulthood with it. Mm -hmm. When it comes to parenting practices, you know, some parents would like to use what you call an uh, autocratic parenting mm -hmm. style whereby uh, you do as I say, yes. and they are encouraging pay, um, you being pay perfect. So any little mistake is not mm. tolerated. Uh, these things will really sell anxiety to the children. And in the end, they will never grow to become responsible adults mm. because anxiety saps into a person's energy. Yeah. You're able to perform socially, occupationally, academically, and the others. So parents are supposed to ensure that they look at how they are going to relate to their children. Of course, we can adopt a number of parenting practices differently for each child, mm -hmm. depending on their needs yes. and their so own children, unique. They, are, they, need, <laughs> they need the hand of God in, <laughs> in their life. Yes. Like my mom gave it to four boys, so you were oh, a bit stubborn okay. with our childhood. <laughs> so you often see her going around, shouting, they oh. said I'd come and find out here and there. But anyway, it has been able to groom us to become mm -hmm. responsible adults. So what will help is that, Sometimes the pine pine beating becomes mm -hmm. a bit too much. Yes. You see, if you reason with children, it builds up their cognitive skills. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most effective ways to be able to raise uh, children mm -hmm. responsibly. So rather than be the child or scold them or rep rep reprimand them severely mm -hmm. for any little mistake they make, we can use approaches by reasoning with them and using what you call positive uh, reinforcement. Mm -hmm. That becomes a better way to parent your children okay. than to use that uh, punishment aggressive style. Yeah, but also today's children too, it seems as though our generation didn't deserve the kings because we were less stubborn than the ones we are seeing these days. Because you see some of these videos where, you know, someone is trying gentle parenting as they term it. Yes. And honestly, you yourself, who you are an advocate for gentle, you see, take the belt and lash this child, <laughs> you know. So... How then do we strike the balance between a firm hand and then, you know, the positive reinforcement? Good. Um, sometimes we have to allow children uh, benefit from 
uh, what they have planted. Mm. It could be something good, it could be something bad. Okay. And that's how come positive reinforcements come in. There are times when reasoning can play a very key role, mm. but there are times too when positive reinforcement. So this is what it means. Positive reinforcement means that you use desirable things to encourage desirable behaviors in mm. your child. Maybe they would like to have a tablet and go and watch, I don't know how they call it, is it a Nickelodeon or something, <laughs> a Disney Channel and the yeah. others. They love it. So you tell them, look, I have encouraged you to do your homework. So once you do your homework and you show it to me, you've done well, you are going to have one hour of watching a Disney yeah. Channel. If you are able to maintain a calm behavior today, you don't run around, you don't beat your, your kids, uh, sorry, uh, your siblings, I'm going to maybe reward you with be something the child likes so much, mm -hmm. I'll take you out to the mall. Okay. So you will use some of those things to encourage that behavior in them. Some parents even use what you call tokens. Like, okay, if you do something good, you have one point, mm -hmm. and 10 points means I'm going to give you this or do that for you. Yeah. This could become ways and means to use desirable things to encourage good behavior. It's like we give attention to the bad things, and that becomes a problem. Okay, okay. So it's getting very educative here. And if you know someone that needs to learn about anxiety disorders, please call or text them to join in the conversation here. We are on social media, YouTube and on Facebook. Look for Clock TV, Coco Digest Morning Show, and let them join. Or, of course, they can tune in to Clock TV on their TV sets or to Go TV Channel 184. We are going for a quick break. When we come back, we will continue with the conversation. And then the phone lines will be opened for you to call and ask your questions. We will be right back. Back to the Coco Digest Morning Show. If you are just tuning in, this is the Coco Digest Morning Show. We are having a discussion on anxiety, disorders, causes, symptoms, everything. And then our phone lines will be opened for you to call in and ask your questions. You can also send your comments, your questions, and suggestions to our WhatsApp number displayed on your screen. Or join the live stream on Facebook and on YouTube and send your comments there as well. So, Jock, hmm... We, we, we veered off a little from the symptoms. So let's go back to that one, the behavioral symptoms of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, the one where they had video Yes, <laughs> it's true. Very true. So it comes to the behavioral or physical symptoms. Mm. You could have the heart uh, palpitations. Okay. Some even go through what you call panic attacks mm. uh, as a symptom of uh, anxiety disorders. Sleep becomes a serious problem when people go through anxiety. Mm. They're unable to sleep at all. And the more they're unable to sleep, the worse the symptoms of anxiety become. Okay. Some people go through gastrointestinal disorders, running stomach. Uh, mm. Some go through running nose. Some get headaches, repeated uh, headaches. Some keep having burning sensations in their eye. Some even lose uh, tastes mm. of food as well. All these become behavioral issues, you see. Then you begin to realize that it's affecting their work. So if they are your colleagues, you realize that their work performance is going down, if it's in school, academic performance is also going down. The way they relate with others could also be going down as well. All these are some of the behavioral effects. Okay. So there are some times where your hands shake. You need to shake. Yes. And even your legs tremble. Yes, even there's some kind of shaking. Or you even realize, I saw a video where it's like, sometimes there are some people sitting in, their leg is bouncing, or one hand is, hand is continuously, continuously tapping something. Are they also symptoms? Uh, very well. And those things are uh, a bit, when, when it starts, it's difficult for, for them to be able to uh, control it. Mm -hmm. You see their hand uh, shaking and going up and down until after a while they are able to calm down. Mm -hmm. All those are symptoms of anxiety. So people don't experience all the symptoms at one. Some experience uh, some symptoms, others experience others mm -hmm. in various ways. Okay. Yes. So, um... The gastrointestinal disorders, disorders that come along with anxiety, how is it related? Okay. Because, yes, I'm anxious about seeing somebody I don't want to see. 
then all of a sudden my stomach is is rumbling or is doing something. How okay. how does how does that even work? Yes, it's because anxiety is not just uh, a simple issue. Okay, it is a mental health issue. Mm. And you see, the brain controls the whole body. Our mind is the most important thing we have. So it controls everything within you. Okay. And when this particular triggers and negative, uh, negative views come up, uh, it begins to create a whole host of neurochemicals within mm -hmm. us. These neurochemicals are brain chemicals. The brain uses to control various things within us. Mm -hmm. And one common one is what you call adrenaline. Okay. So this adrenaline rush can be able to cause that gastrointestinal problems within a person. And some can be running and taking collodium, but it doesn't seem oh. to stop. Yes. Oh. Hmm. So, <clears throat> we have a question here. This is from Mr. Kweko Asante in Tamale. He says, how effective is therapy for anxiety? Anxiety. In fact, you even asked a question initially about uh, some of the latest research mm. developments. It ties in with this. Okay. So, currently, research has shown that anxiety is one of the most effective ways of dealing with anxiety. That is um, therapy or... a therapy. Oh, okay. One of the most effective ways of dealing with anxiety. The reason being that, as I said earlier with the ice clay illustration, mm -hmm. that when you put ice in clay, a mold of clay in the sun, while the ice would melt, the clay would harden. Mm -hmm. The sun is a common element, but it is melting the ice while it is hardening the clay. Mm -hmm. You've also come to realize that uh, going through traumatic experiences, negative situations, environmental problems does not mean mm -hmm. a person should suffer anxiety. It's about the thought factors, the way we interpret the situation. Mm -hmm. So therapy would help you to have a better framework, a better frame of mind, so that we can work with your brain, we can work with your mind, then you find effective ways to use even traumatic experiences to your own advantage. Okay. So, viewers, our phone lines are open, so please do well to call in and ask your questions. So, I want to, I want to ask about the misconceptions about anxiety, but I also want to ask about the religious, at what role religion plays with our anxiety. Because, I mean, this, we were even talking about it, the Bible, yeah, the answers yes. for nothing, all of that. How, how does a, a religious person then navigate anxiety? Because they feel like maybe they've prayed and still they are anxious. Is it that they are not having faith or enough faith or something like that? That is a very good thing we often find in, in the hospitals. And that's what, what that delays people seeking help mm. until it goes out of hand before they come seeking help. You see, the Bible says that um, we should be anxious for nothing at all. Mm. And the Lord Jesus Christ asks us to even stop being anxious. In fact, it's a great fact we have to stop anxiety. We said earlier on that anxiety itself is a normal reaction. Mm -hmm. Everyone goes through anxiety. Those who don't go through anxiety are those who are dead. So <laughs> everybody goes through anxiety. But in the religious circle, it's only talking about a normal physical reaction in life. For example, you are walking about, you see a huge snake, you would get startled, mm -hmm. you might be a bit anxious afterward. All those things are normal. Now the religious circle comes in when people tend to interpret an anxiety disorder as lacking faith. Mm -hmm. Anxiety disorder is not something that a person can just snap out of it. Okay. They need professional help. It's like a person is having uh, malaria or cholera or dysentery or something, and it's uh, preventing them from being able to come to church mm -hmm. or being able to go to work and the others. They need their professional help before they can begin to function yeah. accordingly. Okay. So having an anxiety disorder does, does not mean that you are lacking faith. And this is some misconception we often have in people. Mm -hmm. People feel that, oh, just pray to God and everything will work. Some will see the apostles who read a variety of scriptures from the Bible to inspire them, yet the moment they are done, the anxiety comes yes. again. If you can only give the right solution to the right kind of problem, anxiety is not a spiritual problem. <laughs> it's a mental well, health issue. Some, some religious bodies would beg to differ and say yeah. there's a spirit in here. <laughs> this is, but we have a question that ties in with this topic at the moment. It says, how can individuals differentiate from normal anxiety, uh, bet differentiate between normal anxiety and then anxiety disorders? Yes, okay. And at what point should they seek professional help? That is very great. Yeah, so normal anxiety itself is good for us. It's mm -hmm. healthy for us. It helps us to be able to even do our work 
relate well with others and keep progressing. Mm -hmm. Let me give an example. You have an exam to write. You know, we all have been students before. Yeah. When you know you have about two months to the exam, you are relaxed. Yes. You pick the book to learn about 30 minutes. Yeah, it's like you, you feel like you want to go and watch some movie. Yes. And, then... and it's during the exam period that you want to watch movies. <laughs> because, but when it comes to about three days to the paper, yes. anxiety itself will put you on your... Mm. <laughs> to ensure that you are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. A woman is um, pregnant and she feels like going for an alcohol. But she becomes anxious that, hey, if I pick the alcohol, my yeah. child might suffer some fetal yeah. alcohol syndrome. So it makes them do the right thing. Someone is driving on the road. They feel like, oh, uh, being distracted by something, either a phone call or mm. people passing by. Anxiety can just put you on track that, hey, yeah. I'm by the wheel. So normal anxiety itself is good. It helps us to be able to do the things we have to do. But then it becomes a disorder when the anxiety, the worry, the persistent fear, the trepidation, apprehension, becomes so intense that it's now impeding your social functioning, okay. how you are relating with others. It's impeding your occupational functioning, the work you are supposed mm -hmm. to do. It's really impeding your academic performance, affecting you cognitively, emotionally, and then behaviorally. Then at this point, you need professional help to help you balance things. Okay. So now in the Gen Z <laughs> you know, era, there's a lot of talk about social anxiety. What is social anxiety? Okay, so we have social anxiety itself. And usually, its original use depicts a person who is not able to perform in social settings. Mm. So maybe the, the person would like to be alone or by themselves. They don't mean in a social setting they have to deliver or perform mm. or speak or something. These things come out. This is the original use of it. Okay. By now, Gen Z era, they've expanded this social anxiety <laughs> to refer to other areas of life. Yeah. For example, now you go on social media, it becomes an okay. avenue where. Okay. So let's put the pin in that. We have a caller on the line. Hello, good morning. You're welcome to the Coco Digest Morning Show. Your name and where you're calling from, please. Please. I'm calling from Satan. Okay, your question. I was talking, and I'm I'm telling you, <laughs> bipolar. Mm. Is it the same or similar symptoms of this one? Okay. Okay. So she's asking about bipolar. Bipolar, is yes. Yeah, in fact, uh, Madam Agi is right. I think I forgot that aspect. So when it comes to anxiety disorders. People with other forms of mental disorders also tend to get anxiety disorders. Okay. So you get a person living with bipolar disorder, and they also get an anxiety disorder as well. Okay. So it can work hand in hand with other disorders, because some issues bringing about a bipolar also brings about an anxiety disorder. However, bipolar is not the same as an anxiety disorder. Okay. We have bipolar disorder, and we have anxiety disorder. Okay. So they could be co-occurring. Okay, okay. So yes, back to our social anxiety. Gen Z's are abusing it. So let's get clarification on what it really is. Yes. So as I was saying earlier, we have what you call social anxiety disorder in the manual of mental disorders. Mm -hmm. And that becomes an extreme anxiety that affects a person when they have to perform a social role, as in maybe a church they are called to read maybe the first scripture mm. and the anxiety becomes so intense that they can't perform. Meanwhile, they are well equipped to do it. Okay. A person has to speak on a media platform or something and they become so worried, apprehensive that they are unable to perform. So this one becomes a disorder that affects people in social settings. Okay. By the Gen Z, people are now trying to expand it a little bit to cover other areas of life. Whereby you go on social media, it becomes an avenue where people can showcase what they have and what they don't have. You see people doing snaps and then posting things online about their wealth. You're like, ah, this girl I was in the same school with her. She wasn't even brilliant. Mm -hmm. But how come she's driving all these cars and showcasing expensive rings and now she's getting married and always posting? And that alone makes you so anxious that, hey, ask for me, did I come to accompany people oh. in life? <laughs> and it becomes a basis for yeah. severe anxiety. But, you know, people, people the Gen Z especially, they talk about social anxiety in the terms of, you know, you have a group of friends, you're hanging out. Then one person is more reclusive 
and not forthcoming and things like that, then they are calling it also social anxiety. anxiety. Is it truly so? So, okay, so that is not the usage of the word social anxiety. Okay. Let's know that some people are introverts, okay. others are extroverts. It becomes a problem when you're being introverted or introverted affects your social functioning and occupational functioning. Okay. There are moments when by everyone has a preference. Mm -hmm. You don't want to mingle people in terms of something to be done. For example, I'm not a fan of alcohol. Mm. So if I'm in a social setting, I wouldn't like to go and join, oh, club mamba, kubi and mamba, yeah. I wouldn't do that. But the Gen Z era, we see that, hey, we are all having that this moment. Why wouldn't you join us to be able to do this? So that is not social anxiety okay. disorder. Okay. Yeah. So um, how then do we differentiate between stage fright or even being afraid of this camera here. <laughs> you know, the stage fright, shyness, and then social anxiety. Okay. So with the stage fright, we see a similar issue in, even in children. Mm -hmm. We call it selective mutism. Okay. So there could be a child who is very social, he could be running about, but in some few specific settings, they become mute. Mm. You expect them to perform and they are unable to. Some grow into adulthood with it, and the moment they have this idea that, oh, wow, I'm in public and the whole world is listening to mm -hmm. me. They go through this sort of intense anxiety and they are unable to, uh, to perform. But they could do well in other social settings. Mm -hmm. and people who are shy naturally, this shyness itself could have some bit of normality. Okay. It could also have some bit of abnormality because shyness can become part of someone's personality profile. Mm -hmm. So the person is shy because when it comes to relating with others, they are a bit reserved, mm -hmm. they are too conscientious, worried about how people would see them, they look at how they can conduct themselves effectively. And you may mention of the social anxiety. Yeah. For that one, it affects them, the anxiety affects them in ev almost every uh, social situation. Okay. It doesn't have to be when they are performing on a stage. But even when they feel that they are in a social setting and people could be watching them, it affects the way they relate, the way they speak, the way they eat or carry about their activities. Okay. Yes. So there's a question here. I think the person is still typing some more. Okay. So before, by the time he's done, maybe this question too would be answered. What are common misconceptions in our society about anxiety? About anxiety. Uh, people think that people who have anxiety disorders are weak people. Mm. But that's not the case. As we said earlier, anxiety disorder could even be passed on mm -hmm. genetically. Okay. It could be a, gen a genetic predisposition. So the person hasn't brought it onto himself. So people could go through some form of traumas that are very severe. Mm -hmm. For example, I was in with a patient who was knocked down by a bicycle. It was a very severe one. When she recovered, she was knocked down by a motorbike. Oh. Very severe one. When she recovered, she was knocked down by a vehicle. Very severe so one. Something like this, her family, something's chasing <laughs> Something's chasing <laughs> Then she, she drowned and almost died. Oh. Then she suffered a severe electric shock. She's been through almost That's everything. I told her that, look, people might think that because I'm a professional, I have it all. Mm. But I think that she's been through. I wonder what would become of me if I had passed mm -hmm. through something similar yes. to what she's going through. Clear and ice. Very well, clear and ice. So the fact that I am handling her doesn't mean that I am better off. Mm -hmm. In fact, for someone to go through all these things and still be alive, she has some level of resilience, which I know you will talk about later mm -hmm. uh, during this, uh, this very uh, discussion. Yes. Yeah, so when it comes to these issues, for example, people go through it differently. People go through it differently, and the interpretation of tough factors always come to play. Okay. So people go through it differently. We have to be careful about how we label and people think people are weak, so this woman is not weak, but she's just really a threshold whereby she needs a bit of professional help, yeah. so the person is not weak. And one last thing, people think that those who are going through anxiety disorders, they just have to think positively. That yes. is easier said mm. than done. It's easier said mm. than done. There are times when more than just thinking positively comes to play. Mm. These people tell you that the more you try to think positively, the more the negative thoughts, thoughts also overcome also them. Overcomes them. <laughs> so, yes, the question is complete now. It says, I am 19 years old. Okay. I get frightened with ease. Mostly whenever I see a nice lady. For me, I socialize very well with others. And this, I become, and with this, I become relieved when I socialize. I have chest pains, like blood rushing somewhere in my chest. 
and the space is narrow. Please, is there any test I can do to confirm it is truly anxiety? Anxiety, that's good. In fact, there is a test we we, we run. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we have um, anxiety, back anxiety inventory we use. We have what you call DAS and so many instruments. You should do well to see any professional to administer a test. Okay. And just to be able to confirm okay. and get some interventions. So someone is asking if anxiety can be cured. Oh, yes. People ask this question a lot. Anxiety can be cured. So anxiety cannot be cured. Oh. Because anxiety, that's a bit disappointing. <laughs> but uh, it's a good answer, though. Anxiety cannot be cured. And no mental health professional would even endeavor to cure anxiety. Mm. Because to cure anxiety means you will kill the person. Every human being should have a normal level of anxiety. Mm. But anxiety disorder can be cured. Okay. Thank yes. you. So it is the disorder that can, that be, can cured. be cured. Yes. And I will see you after this. So, all too soon, our time. Is that, and I mean, the last time we had you here was about two months ago. I think we should get you back sooner than two months because yes. it's been too long. It's true. And so <clears throat> I'd like to take your closing remarks mm. and then we'll schedule a part two because, of course, these conversations are very important. True. Okay, so closing remarks. I would say that every one of us mm. is prone to having an anxiety disorder. So let us discourage the stigma. Let's encourage everybody and help ourselves. Mm -hmm. We owe it to ourselves to build each other, to make each other a, a better version of himself than he was yesterday. So let us reach out, let's be open, let's encourage people to seek professional help when the need arises, so we can be able to build a country, society of people who are able to use their mental powers to support individual growth and community growth as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very, very that was Dr. He's a licensed clinical psychologist. And we will be having him back again to come and talk about the other mental health issues. We are all dealing with one or the other. And this conversation, as always, has been very, very insightful. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. And of course, a big thank you to you, our cherished viewers. Thank you for staying with us throughout from 6 a.m. till now. A big thank you to everybody that joined hands to make this show a success. Our security, our drivers, all the parties involved. A big, big, big thank you. And we hope to see you again right and early on Tuesday morning. Do have an amazing weekend ahead. <laughs>